I mean, I think one of the most important chapters of the history of rock and roll, history of music, was the time that all the kids got together, wrote their own songs, formed their own bands, put on their own shows, put out their own records, made their own magazines, set up their own touring networks, you know, set up this whole thing, and the major labels were completely unaware. So Mike, tell us about the tour so far. Well, uh, here we are, and what a show it is, look. <laughs> Luckily, no effects stayed together through the late 80s because all our friends' bands, you know, SNFU and RKL, they all called it quits because there weren't a lot of fans out there. I think it was just a very low ebb for punk rock. I mean, there just wasn't much happening right then. A lot of metal, you know, not a lot of punk. Only there were a few bands in America that were playing punk in the, in the late 80s. I even remember like the Anti Club, which was supposed to be like the last holdout of punk clubs or whatever, said, yeah, we're not really booking punk bands. We just played backyard parties and stuff before that with other punk bands that couldn't get a venue to, to let them play. first started, it was like everybody was playing fast, everybody was playing aggressive, everybody was macho, you know, it, that was, you know, everybody was taking off their shirt and showing off their muscles to, to other young boys taking off their shirts and showing their muscles. And we were like, well, you know, that's not what we want to do, and we want to get into more of songwriting. Bad Religion came back in 88 with Suffer. And that was the first melodic punk album, it seemed to me, in four or five years. For us, that was a big influence. Their music and their lyrics especially were really cerebral and had a lot to do with the human condition and, and our evolution as a species. And I think that just kind of started something that just kind of slowly festered. We put out a pretty decent record. So it uh, kind of reignited the scene in a way. It was right after that that Operation Ivy put out their record. So all of a sudden that year, you know, two really killer records had come out of the West Coast. You know, Operation Ivy was such a huge band to me. They were just like, I was 15 years old when I got into that band. I just remember thinking like, this is like the greatest band in the world. Fuck it, fuck it now. But that's when the punk renaissance started. There was always a few uh, punk rock, you know, splashes in the mainstream, but not from a young new band that was really part of a movement until. Green Day, Green Day, like the Offspring, and I love the Offspring. The Offspring. And Pennywise, Rancid, 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 you know, Green Day, Rancid, Green Day, and and uh, Rancid and the Offspring. I'm surprised it took as long as it did with punk. Uh, part of the reason, I guess, was because the music was so intense, it delayed the inevitable mass embrace. And I figured it was going to happen sooner or later. I mean, the music was too good. Up until Nirvana, Bad Religion and Fugazi had been kind of running neck and neck in a quiet competition of how big can this get because when Ian in a warehouse out in DC and me and Brett in a warehouse on Santa Monica Boulevard each start pushing out like 120,000 albums independently I mean punk rock had never been that big in this this day and age I just kind of proceeded to sign a few bands but all of them did pretty well I signed L7 the next band I signed was No Effects then I signed Pennywise The Offspring Rancid Almost every single band I signed did as well or better than the, the last one. You wanna make a move, then you better come in. The ability, the reason that we're so fit. You're living in your diet, the stories are true. You see your tour collapse, you know it, you're through. But I don't know why she was like that, kind of like that. The one that's on bomb. But I don't know why she was like that. Punk rock's been a creeping virus for a long time. 
Uh, but it really went off like a bomb in 91. Nirvana comes out and sells five, six million records, and it just was like, wow, that's completely out of the ballpark. Followed quickly by The Offspring, Green Day. It was just over. It was just like, wow, this is way bigger than anyone ever imagined. <laughs> That's when, if not pure punk music, punk-inspired music, became a commercial phenomenon in this country. Well, I wouldn't take credit for breaking punk to the mainstream. No, I think that would be a, a dubious honor anyway. Which kind of breaking? <laughs> the reason Green Day broke was because they put in a lot of hard work on their own before they were signed to a major label, and they had built up an audience that was very, very relevant. They stayed at people's houses, they built relationships with their fans. At the same time they were doing that, they were writing great songs that also went on the radio. They happened to make great videos. When we made Smash, we thought the last thing that was gonna happen was a video on MTV. Once we actually had a record that did well and became sort of successful, then it's even much harder to defend the idea that you're a, you're a punk fan. If you have a song that is heard on radio and you're sort of in the mainstream, you know, may, maybe it is a contradiction in terms. When our song Alien first came on the radio, it was really strange. I mean, we'd been playing on the radio a couple times here and there on local radio, but not like, you know, three or four times a day. It was kind of bittersweet because you're you're feeling like, okay, we finally conquered, you know, the powers that be and they gave in to us and and stuff. But at the same time, you know, your friends are calling you up going, dude, what the hell are you doing on the fucking radio? It's cool that some of these bands get exposed, but at the same time, the people that like these bands have been with them for so long and maybe at one point, radio wasn't too friendly to those bands. There's mass media vehicles that didn't exist for punk rock in 1981, radio, MTV, magazine. You were lucky to get your stuff played on college radio, let alone anything commercial. Regardless if you're in a punk band or not, it's weird to hear yourself on the radio for the first time. I was at work when I first heard it on the radio. I'm driving home in a 77 Monte Carlo with my painter's whites on and prison bound comes on the radio and you know, a car pulls up next to me and I just like, you know, I wonder if this dude knows this is me on the radio, man. And, I mean, still painting houses, but, you know, I'm on the fucking radio. It's nice to be able to get the message out to a wider, to a, a larger group of people for free. The real victory for us, I think, was when Fuck Authority got played on the radio. We all really liked that song, and we thought it would be a great song for the radio, but who's going to play a song called Fuck Authority? Sorry, uh, Avril Lavigne doesn't count as punk. Oh yeah? Well, what about the cramps? Stiff little fingers. The Clash. Sex Pistols. I listen to the same music as Marissa Cooper. I think I have to kill myself. It's the punk, huh? I'm angry. Like every creative movement, you know, it starts with an underground base, 
and it and it you know, it attracts people that are like minded, and if it if it's has enough depth to it, then it. It becomes co-opted by the, the main culture. Dexter Holland of The Offspring got his Ph.D. in molecular biology at USC. Greg Ginn of Black Flag graduated from UCLA. The guy from Bad Religion got his master's in geology from UCLA, and he's working on his Ph.D. in evolutionary biology at Cornell. Wow. 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 The society now is totally accustomed to hearing, I mean, when you turn on TV and you hear a commercial that's got like a, a punk rock riff in it, it's pretty incredible because, you know, 10 years ago you would have never heard that. When we presented this Pathfinder spot to our client, it wasn't alien to them. So I don't think they said, well, geez, we love the commercial, but what's with that punk soundtrack? If you were an advertiser and you didn't recognize this demographic of punk rock kids now, you'd be a complete idiot. Everywhere you look, you go to the mall and, you know, every third kid's got like something punk going on. Travis Barker, he has Boost Mode. It's now something that's so like, oh, if you're punk, you're cool, and it was never meant to be something like that. I don't think true punk rock music has been commercialized yet, but I do think the look has been commercialized. Is it life a blast? It's just like living in the past. And we go downtown to do our shopping, and we work in suburban marketing geniuses get a hold of it, and then you see it in boutiques and shops, and, and you see it in Kmart. We'll go to shows and we'll see people wearing, you know, the way they've strapped on their strap. We're in a t-shirt that they've laced up the back and cut, and then we come back and we try to figure it out and put it together. When I first started getting punk, to have a hot topic, I would be like, what? A place that has, like, t-shirts and it's already made and I don't have to go to a show? It started as really just an idea to bring an alternative lifestyle to the malls. The looks on people's faces when they come into new stores opening up in remote towns is great. And just like, oh my gosh, there's a Clash shirt. It's definitely not rebellious now. Green hair is the norm. Tattoos are the norm. Spike bracelets, piercings. It's like, you know, you're not, you're not scaring your mom. Your mom takes you to get it. 25 years later, you know, uh, mainstream, I call the sheep have opened their minds a little bit. Obviously, they're, they're letting their 13-year-old kids dye their hair red now and wear punk rock t-shirts to school. These are the parents who are throwing apples at the punk rockers across the quad in high school. And I know it, but now it's cute because their kid's doing it and it's accepted and it's crossed over. I think it's kind of wonderful and kind of sad that it doesn't have the shock value that it used to. But it's kind of cool that, that, that if a kid wants to dye their hair blue, that they don't have to put up with all the grief. It's become more of a widespread style statement. But it's not really a heart statement. Back in the 70s and up into the early 80s, I think it was a real statement of who you were, where you were what you believed, who your friends were, who your enemies were. When I was growing up, dyeing your hair or looking different was really a commitment, and you were committing to having people react to you in a certain way. Prefabricated rips and tears and all that shit, it's bullshit, dude. I mean, let's fucking look cool for a minute, buy a clothes with some stitched up holes in that shit, and mm -hmm. fucking parade around. I don't know, dude, to me that's just ridiculous, man. You, you might get someone that says, oh, you know, you're in a mall, and you're punk rock, and what have you done to our scene? But most of the bands that are in it really come to us, too, to, to help them kind of get a leg up on getting out there because we're one of the first places they can get distribution. Go for Kevin. I'm out at the front of the line getting doors open. Fuck corporate America was the motto of the day when I was working in the clubs. And then I'm like, well, you know, we spend money in corporate America. Why don't I try to go get some of this? They're going to sell to you anyhow, even though you don't think you're buying it. And I'm going to use some of the money and at least give kids a great day with some of the money. Let's go out and do a tour, get some friends together, some bands. And we treat everyone equally. Let's go out and share buses. Let's go out and do something. Bring a skate ramp. Went out, put it together. But I had worked really hard and I had respect from all these bands and people. But I think people saw that we had something. The merch company.